this, and I'll explain it in a second. It says right here, verse 12, it says, uh, God gave some to be apostles, some to be past, uh, prophets, some to be evangelists, some to be pastors and teachers. And verse 12 says this, to prepare God's people for the work of service so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. How many would like to be in the whole measure of the fullness of Christ? Would be awesome? I want to be in the full measure of the fullness of Christ. I want to have Christ just spewing out of me everywhere I go. Amen. I just want people to see Jesus wherever I go. I want people to feel the love of God wherever I go. So that, I think that would be something that would be the fullness of Christ. Now, how many uh, are there already? No. So that's why I'm going to teach on the sermon today, because we've been talking about family. Our church is a family. We like to fellowship. We like to eat together. We like to do things together. It's really awesome, and we're creating these little mission communities to do that. So we're we, we, if you go on our website, we redid it a little bit. We write, Capital City Church is a family of servant, what? Missionaries. Missionaries. You've heard that over and over and over. And we've been talking for the last couple months more about how we become family, how we help and support each other and love each other. Today we're going to talk, we're going to talk about something that's going to be a little bit difficult. In a sense, we're going to talk about the next part. And over the next couple weeks, we're going to talk about that. What does it mean to be a servant? How many servants do I have here? How many want to be servants? How many say, I don't have time for that? You know? I mean, that's what we sometimes we think about. So we're going to talk about that today. Um, I want, I, we're going to do it. Um, the title of my sermon today is A Shift to Servanthood. A Shift to Servanthood. How do we shift our mind and our thinking to serve over just being served. Amen? How, how do we change our mind even in our homes, in our workplace, and all these things? Jesus was our awesome example of this, wasn't he? Jesus was the King of kings and is the King of kings and Lord of lords. When Jesus came to earth, he came as king, did he not? Of the whole world. But he came in the form of what? A little baby. Right? And his own mission, why he was here on earth, was not only to proclaim the gospel, the kingdom of God is at hand, but he came to serve. But in the natural, we do just the opposite. Put that uh, pyramid up, uh, Britain. So the world has a, life is like this. We have a pyramid. On the bottom is all the workers. Right? Then you have the managers, and then you have the upper management, and then you have the CEO. Right? And our whole life is built around this. We wanna, we're on the bottom, and we're trying to get to the top. Say amen. Right? We want to get more money. We want to have more wealth. We want to get more education. We want to do more things. Right? We want to gather more things. We have a, not just a little house, we want to have the next size house. This is one of the things that we talk about all the time. We have a nice little apartment little duplex, and then we say, well, it, and we talk about, it would be nice to have a house, a big house, you know, we have a big basement, we can entertain people, we have a nice bigger backyard, and all that stuff, but then we go, nah, right? It's not that important, because we can still do what we want to do in the little house that we have, right? So let's just do it, and be happy, and content, and allow God to do that. So we don't want, we have to think, we have to shift our thinking that we're just satisfied with what we have over trying to have more things. Amen? How many like new things, right? New sh I got a new shirt on, so I like new, new things. I mean, everybody likes new things, but can we be happy in what we have? It's a hard thing to do. It's hard for me anyway, and I always want more and more stuff. But we have to look at this. So turn, put the next one on. This is a, more of a spiritual thing. So Jesus came, and as king, he had the right to like have the whole world serve him, right? Just like a natural king would. You know, kingdom is built. The king gets people underneath him to serve him, to help advise him. And then they have all the subjects, all the people in that community is there to serve the king, right? And that's how uh, the natural way of doing things is. But Jesus did just the opposite. He came 
and he served everybody above him. Matter of fact, he even served his enemies, didn't he? Right? He served the poor. He served the needy. He served everybody. He came and humbled. He said to the disciples, and I'll share this at the end, but I'll just uh, talk about this for a second. Jesus' last message before he left earth to his disciples was what? Do you remember the story? He was in the, he, they were celebrating the Passover, and it was a meal. He was sharing what was going to happen. He was going to die. He was going to raise again the third day, and he did something to the disciples. Do you remember what he did? He washed their free feet. Exactly right. Why did Jesus do that? Now remember, they're eating. He gets up. He puts on his uh, um, garment to, to, to wash the feet. And then he went around and washed the feet of all the disciples. And Peter said, no, Lord, you can't do that. We're like this. No, no, don't, don't, I, don't do that to me. Lord, you're, you, I don't want you to cleanse me. And Jesus said, if you don't do this, you don't have a part in the kingdom of God. So the, the Peter says, well, it didn't wash my whole body. That wasn't the point, right? He was talking about that. He was talking about serving because you are going to do this. This is what you're going to do. Your ministry, everything you do after I leave this earth is going to be this, washing the feet of the people. Amen? Serving all people and under, helping to understand the kingdom of God. So we're going to talk about that a little bit more at the end. But let's... let's um, Let's look at this. We have to have a shift, and I don't want this to be like, oh, pastor said, no, we have to serve, so now this week we go out and serve people, right? Or this month, maybe it lasts a month, we go out and serve people. What I'm really thinking is that we have to have a heart change. And something has to happen in here so we can have a, uh, not only an attitude of gratitude for what God's given and done for us, but an attitude, a heart change of serving the world around us, no matter what the cost. Not smile at me because like, it's going to be hard. It's, it's going to be good. This is the maturing part of Christianity. So we were teaching on how to be a family, love each other, and caring for each other. That's that's good stuff. But now we got a part of it. Like now we have to do action. And Dion, I, I love appreciate Dion because we're talking about this this week, and he says, "Yeah, Pastor, you know that's why I started with Ephesians." He says, "Yeah, and Ephesians says that we have to mature. We have to start doing service. We have to actually." do what you're saying that we're supposed to do. And I said, yeah. And that's the hard part because in our hearts, we haven't had that. We're, we thank God for our forgiveness. We thank you, thank him for uh, forgiving our sins and cleansing us from our unrighteousness. And that's great. But the mission, the purpose of that, not only is that we save us from going to hell, that's awesome. We, I'm, I'm so glad for that. Amen. I'm mean, glad that they're forgiven. Amen. And you can continue to be forgiven. We learn. You know, if you make mistakes, you ask God. And he'll cleanse you. He'll help cleanse you and help you uh, uh, overcome the temptation of, of sin. And he does that for us now. But it's, there's something else that now that that happened, there's something that we're required to do. And up to this point, I've been teaching, you have to serve in the church building. That's kind of like my thought. We have to build up this building. We have to take care of each other. We have to help in this church right here. And which is partly true. But reality is that we have to serve everyone. Right? If you're a high school student, you're going to school, you serve those people. You, you, you do your work. You, 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 your behavior should reflect that of Christ. Amen? You don't get involved with talking about people or talking about uh, uh, these issues that, that cause division. You love like Christ loved. Amen? You go and you minister that. You're at work and you're, you're there and you're, you know, you're, your boss is the meanest boss that you ever had. You ever have a real mean boss? I had one that was an evil. I mean, straight up evil boss. And you know what I did? I loved him. Now, only because I wasn't taught. I mean, I just read my Bible every day, and the Lord says a soft answer turns away wrath, right? And, and proper. And I thought, a soft answer turns away wrath. All right, that was a morning devotion before I went to work. So that day, when he started like, cussing me out and doing the things that he normally did, I just said, yes, sir, I'll do exactly what you want me to do. And I walked away. And he wanted to argue more, but I didn't want to argue with them because I didn't, it was, it just, he just, and then he just turned and he just shut up. I mean, he just stopped, like instantly, like it was a supernatural thing. It was like the Spirit of God entered the room right there at that moment because I stepped away from that conflict. I said, no, I'm going to humble myself. I'm going to serve that man, right? And the, the atmosphere changed at my work. He never was that way again. Well, he was still that way, but not as bad, you know what I'm saying? 
It's just something changed because I changed. Our heart has to change towards the things of God. Our, our, um, and what happens is you have to renew your thinking so your heart changes. Amen? So I have to think differently about the situation so my heart changes. Let's turn to the, uh, Philippians. Yeah, the next to Ephesians, the next book over is Philippians chapter 2. And I'm going to read this section. Most of us know this, but I just want to read this section because this section tells us how we're supposed to change our heart and attitude to be like Jesus. It says, verse 1, it says, If you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from His love, if any fellowship with, his, with the Spirit, if any tenderness, sorry about that, let me move this down a little bit. Then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and purpose. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, but in humility consider others better than yourself. Turn to your neighbor and say, you're better than me. You're better than me. Huh? Think of others better than yourself. How many? That's not natural. Right? We all, we're, you know, when you say, I, I'm, you're better than me. You're a kid, You're better than me. And where does that put me? I'm at a place where I'm going to serve now instead of I'm lording over somebody. Amen? I'm not better than anybody. I'm a sinner saved by grace. I used to not say that because I thought, you know, I'm, I'm a sight now. I'm not a sinner anymore. But I am. I'm, I was a sinner. I'm saved by grace. I walk in victory now because of what Jesus did for me. It's nothing I did on my own. All I did is believe. I believe that what Jesus did on the cross for me, it, it happened. And so when I believe, all of a sudden something happened in my spirit. I was dirty, I was no good, I was, I, was, I was just wrecked, I was a mess. And then at that moment when I believed, it's like God just changed me inside. I mean, the, every, I, was, I was in jail at the time, but I was like, everything looked cleaner. Everything looked, I mean, I saw things through the eyes of God that I never, I, when we went outside, it was like the clouds were, it was North Carolina, so beautiful big clouds and the sky was blue. It was, just, it was amazing. The trees were so green. I'd never seen green trees like that before. I, I just, everything was just amazing. The birds were singing, chirping in the, in the, in the tree line behind the, the, the jail. It was just amazing. I just was like in awe. God changed me. My attitude changed. Everything about me changed at that moment because I believed what Jesus did for me. Amen? And that's the change we need now about servanthood. We need to have a change in our heart and mind so we can be like Christ. And so we can serve without thinking, oh my goodness, so I got to do one more thing. Pastor wants me to do this. I mean, we complain, complain, grumble, grumble. Grumbling is a sin. Do you say amen? amen? Complaining is a sin. So turn your complaining into joy. Turn your frown upside down and smile or something. You know, I don't know. I can come up with a bunch of them. But then the bottom line is we have, there's, if we complain about our situation, the enemy is laughing at us. Because yeah. when you complain, your faith goes away. It just diminishes when you start complaining. This is a side note. This is not even my notes today. Free for you today. Complaining is a sin. Say it with me. Complaining yeah. is a sin. All right. So to stop complaining, we're going to have joy. Have joy. Thank you. Stop complaining. We're going to look at every difficulty as a situation that God's going to bring me through. Just like if I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. I'm going to make it through the situation. Hallelujah. Come on, we're in a, we have victory. We go from victory to victory. It's interesting how the psalmist wrote that. We go from victory to victory because, you know, we have victory here. Yay, thank you, God. And we go through this hard time in our life. Come on, you know what I'm saying? We go through that hard time because God is changing us. God is changing our heart and changing our mind to be in the image of Christ. So he takes us through this school time, this training time, this, this difficult time. Yes, God, no matter what, I will trust you. Huh? No matter what, God, 
I will trust you. You are there. Your word says that you will never leave me nor forsake me. That means you're always there with me. By your spirit, we're now the temple of God, so your spirit dwells in me, so I can have knowledge and truth and comfort because of the spirit of God in me. Mm -hmm. Hallelujah. Come on, don't shout me down when I'm preaching good, right? <laughs> Come on, you know that's good stuff. The Holy Spirit is in you. You have power to overcome everything. So my attitude needs to change. Yep. I need an attitude change about the servanthood. I need a shift in my thinking that I need to be like Christ. That's what this is about. Let's go down a little bit further. It says, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. You can look that up and figure that out. But in humility, consider others better than yourself. Each of you should look not only to your own interests, but the interests of others. Now, come on. I got so much stuff going on, God. You know, I got this crazy. How am I supposed to take care of other people? Right? But that's what he's saying. Take care of others. Look out for Louise's interests. I don't know if you're interested in that, but we'll find out. Right? That's part of the problem. We don't know people. Because we don't practice humility. We don't, I mean, hospitality. Paul said, practice hospitality. Peter talks about hospitality. Jesus said hospitality. Why? You invite people in your home, you feed them, you get to know them. That's too much work, Pastor. You don't know my schedule. No, I know. I'm just telling you I want to help you mature in the fullness of Christ. I knew this morning when I woke up, I said, this is not going to be easy to preach this morning. Because if I want to mature in the fullness of Christ, that means I have to listen to what this scripture is saying to us. We have to be like Christ. What happens, what happens when you put others' interests above yourself? Your needs are always met. Mm -hmm. I don't know how it works. I, I can't tell you how it happens in the supernatural. I don't know what happens. But when you put others' needs before yourself, it seems like my situation is not as bad as I thought it was. Because I'm not concentrating on that. I'm actually helping people. Because what you want to do is you want to lift them up, share with them your faith, and they, so they can walk in love in Christ Jesus, the same love in Christ Jesus that you have. So I want to help lift that person up. It takes sacrifice, but God... Oh. All right, let's go on. Your attitude should be the same as that of Christ. Now look at this. Your attitude, your thinker, <laughs> should be the same as Christ, who, being the very nature of God, did not consider himself equal with God, something to be grasped. So Jesus, even though he was the King of kings and Lord of lords, all authority was given to Jesus, Heaven is his, the earth is his footstool, everything is Jesus. He said, no, I'm, I'm not going to exalt myself to that position. I'm going to exalt Father God. Mm -hmm. Right? Even though he, he was equal with God, even though he has authority of God, he, uh, Father God, he, he didn't want to grab, he said, no, I'm going to humble myself, right? And he, but, uh, look verse 7, but made himself nothing, taking on the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being formed in the appearance of a man, and he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on the cross, which is the worst horrible death you could die in that time. He humbled himself, became a little baby, grew up as a toddler, was a four or five year old, was a teenager, had a little rebellious streak there. You know, we read that in scripture. Jesus wound up in the temple, teaching in the temple, but mom and dad were heading back home. Mm -hmm. Where is Jesus? We've got to go find him. He's in the temple teaching all the scholars what the scripture says at 12 years old. But he was a teenager. He says, don't you know I have to be about my father's business? That's pretty powerful. I got in trouble with that one day when uh, we had... Uh, Sunday school teacher that was very hard on us if we didn't show up at Sunday school at the right time. But I was about, I was picking up a bunch of young Marines to take them to church that morning. And so I was late for Sunday school. And so I walk in and it's like, you know, it was a military time, so I guess it was easy to embarrass people in the church because that's what they did a lot. Um, which we try not to do here. But uh, Brother York, right? Paul York. He says to me, where were you? How come you're late? You know, like the class of about 40 people in there. And I walk in with these two 
you guys. I said I was about my father's business. Shut up right up, right? Like, what did I do? Go to Sunday school class or go get these guys and bring them to church, right? I mean, it wasn't I was trying to be rebellious. I just said, hey, you know, there's a greater work that had to be done at that moment. So anyway, I, I just, you know, if you're late for church and you bring somebody, I think I'm cool with that. All right? <laughs> Therefore, God exalted him because he humbled himself and because he served even unto death. God exalted him to the highest place that and gave him the name that is above every name, that the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow, come on, every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. That's going to be a great day, amen? <laughs> and every every enemy of God's going to bow, everybody that believes is going to bow, every angel in heaven is going to bow, we're going to bow down and we're going to worship Jesus because what he did set us free from the bondage of sin and our guilt was gone because we did on the cross. Praise you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. That's another thing. If you want to change your attitude uh, about being a servant, then you could start by praising him like first thing in the morning. Mm -hmm. and thank him. Lord, thank you for this day. Thank you that whatever hits, comes my way, you are going to be with me, God, and I'm going to overcome that through you. And even if it's the worst day of your life, like the students in, in, in Oregon, and they lost their lives this week, have yeah, you read that, heard about that in the news? So some students, some gunmen came in and said, are you a Christian? Stand up. And he, if they said they were a Christian, he, he shot them in the head. Right? I think there's 10 people that died, I'm not sure exactly. And he shot the other ones in the leg or something. Um, just craziness stuff that happens. But what, I was just thinking, that if I was the next person in line, he shot this person next to me, and I'm the next person in line, what would I say? And undoubtedly, I would say I'm a Christian. I would try to take his gun from him too at the same time, but I would, I would, uh, I could do that. So I mean, I can, you know, what I'm saying I would, I would probably do what the other guy, the other army guy did, it went after attack him and stop him from going in the room. So he didn't delay him from shooting other people. Got shot seven times and, and he's alive. I mean, amazing story. We'll find out about that later. He probably a born again, spirit filled Christian. He had, he automatically went into this protective mode because of his training and try to stop the guy from going in that room. So anyway, I'm just thinking, you know, my attitude has to change because, not because of what's going on in the world, because I want to see as many people come to Jesus before whatever happens, happens next. Mm -hmm. Right? We know Jesus is coming back. There's nothing, the scriptures plainly says that he's coming back, and we need to be prepared for that. But let's, my, um, my thought is, let's not be prepared for him coming back. Let's already be ready because we're already serving and we're loving and caring for people. As we're loving, we're giving a cup of cold water to we're giving clothes, we're going to prisons and helping people. We're just, we're doing things that he said that you're doing as you're doing them unto them, you're doing them to me. And then when he comes back, he'll say, well done, my good and faithful servant. Right? He'll say, look at Luis, you did a one, he'll tell you all the things that you've done for him. But we have to change here to be like Christ and humble ourselves to serve the community and serve our, we should serve our family, right? We should serve our husbands, serve your wives. Wives, serve your husbands. What amazing concept. What marriages would be so amazing in America or across the world if people just serve each other? You know, right now in some cultures, you know, well, even in our culture, I'm the head of the household. That's what the Word of God says. So <laughs> I'm the king. <laughs> right? I want this, I want that, right? Or I could do like I do. I do laundry at our house. Right? Tina has done laundry in a long time. I just do it. I did it when the kids were there at home, and now I continue to do it. So every Friday afternoon is my day off on Friday, so I just do laundry. Except for yesterday, I didn't do laundry, so we have to do it next week. But anyway, we <laughs> have yeah, plenty of books. But, you know, so it's just it's something I do. Or, um, in the kitchen, Tina cooks. I don't cook. I'm a horrible cook. I hate cooking. You don't want to eat my food? I had your food, Pastor. Uh, you had my food. Well, this is not the grill I can throw a steak over or hot dog over. I can get past that. Grilling's fine. But other past that, forget it. But, uh, but when we're done, when people come over and they're leaving, then I, we go in the kitchen, we wash the dishes, we put in the dishwasher with these dishwashers, we wash all the pots and pans, and I put them all away. That's what I do. Tina used to think that I didn't like the way she kept towels, but really I just can't stand seeing stuff on the counter, so I just do it myself, right? Mm -hmm. It's my problem, not hers, right? So you had to get over that because realize it was just I wanted to put stuff away. Serve one another. 
Amen? Serve your children. Serve your loved ones. Serve them. When you serve and you humble yourself to serve, then God will lift you up. Yep. Amen? God will exalt you. You don't have to try to be exalted. God will exalt you to a different place. Amen? That's what the Word does. I will exalt. I'll lift you up. So I'm going to serve you and love you and care for you greater than anything else. But it takes a, 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 a it really takes a mind shift. And we have to say this is the, being a Christian means serving everyone. Even those that despitefully use you. Amen? So part of the, what we do at Capital City Church, we're kind of reteaching some things about Christianity. And it's not complicated, but it's hard, I think, to love one another here, to serve one another here, to get to know each other here, right? So we can, the world will see our love for one another and they'll be drawn to Christ. And then to be servants to one another. Amen? And it might be different than what we already perceived that that should be. That's why we have to go back to scriptures and see what Jesus said. So it's like going to a restaurant. Jesus said, come in to this restaurant. And everybody comes in, they sit at the table, and they wait to be served. Sure. Sure. But you know what God's saying to you today? You belong in the kitchen. <laughs> hmm? We belong in the kitchen. We need to prepare the food. We need to prepare the place. We need to prepare so we can serve people. Amen? Uh, that's, is that hard? That's a good picture, right? We're, we, we go to be served, but we belong preparing to serve. Amen? How do we do that? You know what? I don't know. I don't have like a list of things to do. But I really believe with all my heart, the Holy Spirit already put in your heart something that you should be doing. Right? Something you can help. And I think it's like, sometimes it's, uh, it's continuous um, speaking of the Spirit in our hearts. It's a continuous being awareness of the Holy Spirit. Because sometimes that sir could just be uh, in an inconvenient time for you. And the Holy Spirit will say, hey, go do, you see that person there? You need to stop and help that person. Hey, God, I got like things to do. Well, he knows that. God knows your life better than you know yourself. Does he not? He's saying, take a minute and help this person right here. Because I want to show my love to that person through you. Hallelujah. This is good stuff, huh? <laughs> All right. Second point is our status. Our status in Christianity is the opposite of our status in the world. Amen? Our status, our status, we have to have a nice car, we have to have a nice home, we have to have wealth, we have to have a good education, we have to have all these things. And it's just the opposite in Christ Jesus. Yep. Amen? Is there anything wrong, wrong with having wealth? Nope. No. Is there anything wrong with having a nice car? Nope. No. Is there anything wrong with having a nice home? No. But well, what is God telling you to do? <laughs> right? Because in America, you can have anything you want. All you have to do is sign a piece of paper. Come on. God, I used to remember being down south, we down south, the, you know, people used to pray over cars and stuff, and they say, God gave me this car. I'm like, wow, that's a nice car, young, young, young guy. I said, that's a real nice car. Uh, how did God give you that car? Well, the bank, he signed the bank, no. I said, so who owns the car? God owns the car or the bank? I mean, you didn't, God didn't give it to you. You just qualified for the loan. You got a loan. I mean, I think that's not really God. Are you in agreement with me? A little bit? You know what I'm saying? God, I mean, God helped you qualify because you had a good score or whatever. But yeah, I just think that's kind of like, the, yeah, I don't think so. If God gave you a car, he'd like give you a car. Yeah. Right? Like Andy and Rachel got a car, got a phone call. Hey, I heard you cracked up your car. I have a car for you. You want it? And he's like, ah, we can't afford a new car. Oh, no, we just want to give it to you. Yeah. That is very cool, right? I'm really excited for them. But listen, yeah, uh, so it's not about those things. So a mind shift in us is a heart change so we can look at things and not realize the same worldly standards that we live by. God's just upside down. It's like the upside down B thing, you know, our triangle. We're here to serve, and all the rest of that stuff really is not important. And I 
think when I look at the news and world events happening, all the stuff in Israel and all the stuff that the blood moons and all that stuff that everybody's talking about today, mm -hmm. right? Say, is the end of the world near? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. So what do we do? Like, be afraid and sit and wait for Jesus to come back? You know, I mean, or are we going to be about the Father's business and actually go and do what the Holy Spirit is prompting us to do on a daily basis? Amen? Amen. Do, do. And say, so it's not, remember we talked, we said, um, we have to know who God is. We know that He set this up for us. Our identity is now in God and not in what we do, right? Remember we shared that a few months ago as we went there? So our identity now changes to being like Jesus, right? We're his child, we're his uh, brother, if you will. We're, we're, we're joint heirs with Jesus, mm -hmm. the word of God says. So we have the same mission as Jesus did. And then he said we do greater works, right? Jesus said we do greater things than he did. Well, I don't have to die on the cross, that's already done. Right? I don't have to, I don't have to lay my life down unless it's required like the, those guys happen in Oregon. I'll do that. Or, or in overseas in Saudi Arabia and all those areas where people are getting killed because they're Christians. That could happen in America. It's been happening in America. We don't hear it on the news anymore like we should. But anyway, that's another story. But people are dying just because they're Christian. Mm -hmm. Dude, like, I can't. Nobody stops Muslims. No, they don't. They, why do people hate the Jews and hate Christians? Because the enemy, the devil, is working powerfully right now to deceive people. They're blinded. They can't. The, the truth is not in them. Mm -hmm. So as we humble ourselves and serve, things happen. I remember um, who's that? Mike Warnke is that the guy, the comedian, the Christian comedian back in the seventies. 70s, you know, a long time ago. Anyway, uh, he was a he was a he was a, a comedian. He was he was in a boot camp, in Navy boot camp, and he was a corpsman in in Vietnam in a marine with a marine unit. He was a corpsman, and he's he's funny, he's hilarious. You can look him up and just listen to his story about Vietnam. It's so funny. But anyway, um, he was sharing Christ with some of the people in boot camp, and they took him and threw him in a broom closet and beat him up. Because he was a Christian. He didn't resist. They beat him, bloodied him, and he took the blood off his hanged face and he said, This blood God, it is what Jesus did to forgive your sins. And those guys became believers by the end of the camp because he humbled himself mm -hmm. and said, No matter what you do to me, the blood that you see here, the same blood that was shed for you. Jesus forgave all your sin. And they changed. It's amazing. It's an amazing story. And I just, I just think about that. So you have to change our thinking about who we are as we serve. And there's also a place for you to serve. There's a spot. So we have we have a servanthood, we have status, and then we have now we have a spot. There's a spot for you to serve. God has a place for you to serve. But let's just take Capital City Church for a minute. So we have a different place to serve. We have greeters now. Thank you, Jesus, for Jason and Randy to come and greet everybody at the door, right? And Cindy, and it's nice to get greeted, right? Everybody else get greeted. Before, it was just me and Tina, so we're like, hey, hi, I'll be there in a minute, we're getting ready for service, you know? And now we have, uh, Rachel had reorganized the nursery, so now we have a nice little nursery uh, uh, thing going on, rotation, so the parents that come with little ones, they can go and serve. We have uh, children's church downstairs, uh, Brad and Crystal have come and and uh, they serve there, and uh, people help them. I thank you for helping them. So there's a lot, of, a lot of places to serve in our little church. But more than that, I mean, this is great. I love doing this kind of stuff. I love getting together and having the church organized, and it makes it fun. And uh, I love getting together with God's people every Sunday. I think we'll continue to do this till Jesus comes back. But there's always another place to serve. There's another spot to serve. There's another place in our community 
that we can share the love of Jesus. This is the part where our mind has to change. Because remember, everywhere Jesus went to, he either healed the sick, delivered them from demons, right? Shared the truth with them. I think the woman at the well, I love the story. Here's a woman with, you know, with many husbands. The one she was with wasn't even her husband. And he didn't care about all that. Mm -hmm. Right? He didn't care about what their sin was or what they're involved in or, or how the you know, how the, uh, demon possessed they were. He just went there and told truth and loved them. This is where our mind, our mind has to change because it's so natural for us to want to judge people. Mm -hmm. Can you say amen to that? I know that's, I don't want you to affirm that. I'm just saying, yeah, I'm like that too, right? We yep. judge so quickly because we never hear the whole story or never take the time to learn the whole story about that person. And that's why I'm thinking I'm on this one little kick in my, uh, as I minister uh, the last few times, I always say this, I'm probably going to say it right now. That's why it's so important that we practice the gift of hospitality. <laughs> Just look it up. Do a uh, word search on your um, Google or uh, in the Bible app. Yes? So we, on that topic, and as Dan said, as far as taking action, we felt the same. And even though everything's completely crazy, as you well know, yeah. in terms of schedule, there's an organization in our community called MOP. And they work with families, women, children, but families that are financially distraught. And they have a food pantry. They don't sell items like their bills, resell yeah. items. Yeah, Middleton Outreach Ministries, that what it is. Yeah, it's on yeah. Mentor Street, yep. north of 14 Airport Road. Mm -hmm. And we've gone in there and talked with them. They have, during the holidays, they try to get people to help with the families that are there. So we're trying to work on a program we call Adopt a Family. So we want to try to have maybe people at church look at that too, or maybe we all collectively just adopt one family. And during the time of the holidays, we can get them gifts for the holidays, or invite them to our house for dinner, or Thanksgiving, you know, definitely. Amen. And I like that. You know, and what's beautiful about that, Jason, we want to do that. That was something we've talked about for years. And so now you're doing it, or you're at least getting over it. So find out the facts, get up, get what we need to do, and then we'll present it here in a couple weeks so we have some time to plan for maybe really helping a family. Because you don't know, people just need stuff, you know. Mm -hmm. And during the holiday season, I really, I can just be honest with you, I just, the holiday season is so commercialized, it doesn't mean anything, you know what I'm saying? Yep. But people that are non-believers during this time are so open to the Spirit of God. Mm -hmm. So I don't like the commercialism. I don't like the whole Christmas. I don't like it. I think it's wrong. Jesus was born in December. <laughs> Come on. Yeah. You know, we all know that. Yeah. And, you know, but that's what, the, that's what the Catholic Church created years and years ago to, to, to offset some pagan holidays. But so they did this. God takes even evil people and uses them. That's right. Mm -hmm. Exactly. The wealth of the wicked are laid out for the righteous. So of all the people with a lot of money, you say, hey, let's help these people. <laughs> Come on. Yeah. Right? If, okay, so let's say you guys organize this thing and we help out. Right? Everybody helps out. We'll talk about it. And then we go to some people that are not even believers and say, hey, we're helping out families. We need some money. We need some cash. We need some presents. We need to fix their roof or we need to fix their water heater. Whatever they need, right? I mean, just, it could be amazing that we could help one family like that, right? So we don't have the cash maybe here between us, but there's people out there that do, you know? Glenda worked at a lawyer's office. She knows a lot of people. She just go up there and say, listen, we want a thousand dollars from each of you. <laughs> Come on, you know? We're, we're helping the community. They love that. See, the world loves to help things because they, they, it's a status thing for them. Feel good. It doesn't, look, look, it doesn't look. even have to be money, though. It, it can just be simply the fact that you're opening your home just for the fellowship. Absolutely. Maybe tutoring some of the kids that need some help or just lending an extra hand. Sometimes mom and may just need a break. Yeah. You know, I mean, it just kind of goes like here. I mean, we've got great people doing wonderful things with the kids in the nursery and, you know, give some of the parents a break to come on in and just, you know, enjoy the service. Exactly. So let's, let's, let's. Create that, or find out the contact. Make sure we, we can do what what you what you want to do there, and then we'll just kind of that'd be a great project. One thing we do in November is we do the international Thanksgiving dinner. We might change that this year a little bit. Uh, we'll we'll know by next Sunday. We'll give you information about that. And then we last year we did for the first time ever we did a Christmas thing. 
It was the silliest thing ever. Remember, we had a couple people say, hey, Pastor, we need to do this Christmas thing. And blah, 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 because all the people that came for the, for the International Thanksgiving dinner. So we got the names out. We sent out invitations right through email, which we found out was the best way to communicate with internationals. And they had like 75 people come to the Christmas thing. And then we had cookies and hot chocolate downstairs. And so during the downstairs time was where we connected with some of the internationals. So we got to actually know them. And their biggest question is, tell me about what Christmas means. Mm -hmm. They wanted to know. They were hungry to know what the st real story behind Christmas was. Yep. I mean, come on. How easy is that, right? A couple of cookies, some hot chocolate, and a little bit of time. And here we've got to share Jesus with, a, with an international that will never heard about what Christmas is about. They, it's American tradition. Well, it's all over the world, but you know what I'm saying. They, they don't know. Some people don't know, especially our Chinese <coughs> friends that have come. They don't know. You know. They don't know about Jesus. A lot of them are just atheists, the young, especially the young people. They're not Buddhist or Hindu or nothing. They're just like nothing because they're tired of reli organized religion back home. See? Just like our young people in America. They just don't like organized religion because it's just too religious. Yep. So they just say, I don't believe in nothing. But then when you get to talk to them, and you find them hard to reason because somebody offended them, like this one Chinese student I talked to, his grandfather was so mean to him about going to the temple all the time. So he's like, when he got to America, that's it, I don't believe in nothing. But to me, you can't not believe in something. There's no way that you can't believe in God because his spirit goes and draws men all over the world to the saving knowledge of Jesus that the Holy Spirit does. And he prepares their hearts for us to proclaim the gospel to them. Amen? So you don't you just have to be willing to share. Uh, because the Holy Spirit is always doing his work already. So I love doing my little Uber and drive, driving around and sharing Jesus with people that go, I just want to ride to the airport. You get more. Let's turn, I want to share with you, close with the first story I talked about. Let's go to John chapter 13. And I'll end with this. I think it's all about being like Jesus. My prayer has been lately, Father, I want to be like Jesus. Father, change my mind. Change my heart. I'm driving. I'm thinking about this. I'm, yeah, I went deer hunting this week, so I went one day, and I was out in the woods. And I'm like, can I be like you? Can I be like you, Jesus? Can, can the compassion and the love and the servanthood that Jesus demonstrated, can I be like that God? And can I communicate it to the church this Sunday? That all we have to do is serve. Wow. Serve. Serve each other in this, in this building. Serve um, the rest of the church family that's not here. And serve somehow in our community. I like what you said, Jason. That's an awesome place to serve. Just, you know, and you don't have to like, oh, look what Jason and Randy is doing. You know, we don't need a banner. We just, you know what? We just go and humbly tell that ministry. They got a lot of organized. It's a great ministry. They do a wonderful. We send people there sometimes to help get finances. So that they do a wonderful job. And they have most of the, the Middleton community actually give donate food. Like the uh, last year's uh, senior class donate their their class project was bring food to and the food bank. Citywide, as far as college cities, it's not Middleton. It's it's Madison. It's you know going to Oregon. Yeah. I mean, it, it's anywhere. Yeah, it's amazing. So we can connect with some people or whatever, or you just go meet your neighbor and find out what they need. I mean, it's just an attitude of serving. Look what Jesus did here. He watched the feet of um, the disciples. And um, verse 13, uh, I don't want to read the whole thing, but it's like, just what? Uh, yeah, chapter 13. Let's go, to, let's go to verse 7. Use your plot. Um, you do not realize now what I am doing, but later you will understand. No, Peter said, uh, you sh shall never wash my feet. Jesus answered, unless I wash you, have, have no part with me. Then, uh, then Lord Peter answered, uh, replied, not just my feet, but my hands and my head as well. Jesus said, a person who has a bath needs only to wash his feet. His whole body is clean, and you are clean, 
though not every one of you. So you're referring to what? Not every one of you are clean to this because he's going to betray Jesus just a little bit here. Mm -hmm. But what's, really, what's being here is, and you are, he said to Peter, you are clean because he believed. But he still walked, had to wash his feet. Why? Uh, why? Is he the sinner? You're clean. You, everyone here is clean. If I had a bad thing, I'd watch all your feet this morning. I wanted to bring that today. I forgot this morning. But I have a little bowl. I was going to wash Richard's feet this morning. I was going to tell him. I didn't tell him. I was going to tell him in advance. But um, <laughs> why is that so? What it, was Jesus saying here? He was saying that I was the king of kings and lord of lords. And I humbled myself to serve the whole world. And you, after my resurrection, are going to serve. And you aren't going to lord over anybody. Mm -hmm. You're not going to be better than anybody. You're going to serve. And that's why when Peter and John on their way to the temple, right? There was a criminal mm -hmm. man there begging that morning, like he always had. And tells him, like, listen, silver and gold have done, but such that I have in the name of Jesus, rise up and walk. Strength came to his legs and got up and started praising God. Immediately. He didn't go praise John. He didn't praise Peter. What he did he begin to praise God? That's the key when you do proper servant. Mm -hmm. They're not going to give glory to you. Oh, Jesus, you're so wonderful. You provide all. No. We did this. We humbled ourselves. We're going to serve this family. And I want you to know that we did it because God loves you. Mm -hmm. So all the attention goes to Him and not to us. We humble ourselves as servants like Jesus. Said. That's what Peter, that's why he washed her feet. You need to know this lesson. This is a, one of the most important things about this. He get ready to go to the cross and die. And this was the lesson that he left with them. I mean, all the things I could think about, Jesus saying, give me more power to heal people. Give me more power to deliver people from demons. Give me more. No, he said, no, I want you to humble yourself because the power was going to come, right? Fifty days later, he, the Holy Spirit came upon them. And they were due to power. They began to preach the word of God with boldness, right? And signs and miracles happen. Those signs and miracles still can happen today. And my question to you is why don't they? Because we're not humble enough to give God all the glory for everything in our lives. I truly believe that's the truth. That's why our minds need to change. God be glorified in my life. Nothing I do to bring attention to myself, but only to you, God. Hallelujah. Only to you, God. Maybe today we need to do that. Maybe today we need to look in ourselves and say, listen, my mind needs to be renewed. Maybe in my heart I haven't been really born again. Maybe I don't believe what, I, what everything is being said. Today I need to examine myself and say, God, am I a believer? Close your eyes. Am I a believer? Am I a servant? Am I, can I humble myself and lift up Jesus in every aspect of my life? In every problem, in every situation, in every, every, every um, encounter, God, can I bring you glory? Can I bring you glory? Maybe for some of us this morning, we said, Lord, help my unbelief. That I can believe what you are doing in my life right now. Maybe some of us need to repent. Lord, please forgive me for not obeying your spirit as you lead me in my life. Lord, help my pride so I can humble myself enough to serve you so that the world will know who you are. Lord, I'm so concerned about my situations and my needs. I just can't even think about anything else. God, help me to renew my mind to love others as you love them. Hallelujah. Wherever you're at this morning, just ask the Lord. Right where you ask, say, Lord, change me into the very image of Christ. And I'm going to share the truth with you that you already are. the garden, God created us, Adam and in his image. When you're born again, when you believe and you are a follower of Jesus, you are in the image of Christ. Amen. Receive that this morning. Receive that. Receive that. I'm made in the very image of Christ so I can be Christ's life to the world around us. Hallelujah.
love you. Father, as we close this morning, I pray for each person that's in this room. I pray for those in our family that's not here, God. I pray for humility. Not false humility. Not like I'm trying to do this, God, but true humility to serve one another here and to serve the world around us. To make Christ known. To make Him known that the world will be drawn to the Father, be reconciled to the Father, that the sins of the world can be given because of our love for these people and for one another. If it's helping the Middleton Outreach Ministry, or getting to know our neighbor, or sharing our faith with our co-workers, God, whatever it is, God, I pray you help us to do that. Start in our families, Lord, with our husbands, and our wives, and our children, and our co-workers, and our people where we buy our groceries, God, wherever we go, Father, I pray that we the light and share your love and grace. Let us practice the hospitality, God. That's a hard one.